Um, sure, hold on to the mic. <laughs> so you guys have the mic. Yes, hold on to it. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I didn't know there was a second anniversary. I didn't know it was the second anniversary of Tech Tuesdays. Totally what? Put here. down the mic. It's cool. I was actually here. <laughs> mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> so, I was actually here uh, almost like a year ago. One invited me out, and um, back then I was kind of just getting started with this. And so today I'm going to talk about co-working um, and the RGB and the death of the home office. So, how many of you have heard of co-working before? Okay, about Okay, so the freelance economy. So that's something that's you know such as uh, home for a lot of you know people in this industry. Um, with technology, there's a lot of freelancers, and with a lot of other industries, there's becoming a huge <coughs> amount of freelancers in, in those as well. And so uh, Harvard Business Journal talked about the rise of the super temp. So I found this actually right before coming over here, and I kind of wanted to share it with you guys. I was just scrolling through a Twitter feed and. This kind of popped up. I thought it was really cool. Is how freelance work has evolved over the past few years. So if you look on the top left side, in the 1820s, a freelancer was a medieval mercenary warrior or a freelance. Um, in the 1940s, firms such as Manpower and Kelly Services emerged. 1890s, first staffing firms emerged, such as uh, Johnson Employment Agency and those other ones. In the 2000s, forums and job boards such as Monster, Craigslist, and Career Builder kind of emerged from. Uh, the internet. In 2008, social recruiting through sites like LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook became popular. In 2010, marketplaces such as Elance, Odesk, Freelancer.com, and 99designs um, <coughs> started becoming, catching kind of a lot of steam. Have, have you guys heard of all these? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, 2012, platforms such as Uber, Instacart, Airbnb, and Kickstarter kind of took the world by storm. And uh, 2014, big data, mobile, gamification of talent. And on the bottom it says, coming soon, freelance management platforms, companies creating their own internal marketplaces, and managing robot freelancers. So, um, you know, if you look back at the 2012, there's people here in the Valley that still haven't heard of Airbnb. They don't really know what Uber is or how it works and stuff like that. But, you know, it's slowly gaining popularity, getting a lot of steam, and, you know, these platforms are becoming kind of like a place for freelancers to get work and people to kind of give work to people. Um, I read a statistic last year that Airbnb outgrows the Hilton worldwide. So you think about that and they don't own a piece of property in the world and, you know, they're outgrossing one of the biggest hotel chains. So, you know, looking at freelancing um, now because of technology, you can basically work wherever you want. You need a laptop and a cell phone, a connection, and you're ready to go. So what this has created over time is um, people in home offices in isolation. So if you're working for yourself, by yourself, and you're inside your house all alone, uh, you have no one to talk to other than your cat or maybe the mailman when you self um, Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so it created a lot of isolation. People kind of get bored, and what, and what do most people do nowadays? they hop over to a Starbucks, right? People want that social interaction, they want to sit around other people and like feel that human connection. But at Starbucks, or at Moonbeams, or wherever your local coffee shop is, you're still sitting kind of by yourself. You know, people are around you, but you're not really socializing, you're not really connecting with them. Um, so enter co-working. So, co-working spaces, this is like the recent statistics from uh, this past year's co-working survey, 84% Co-working spaces are workspaces. 84% that were more engaged and motivated when co-working. 67% said co-working improved their professional success. 69% they feel more successful since joining a co-working space. And 64% of the respondents said co-working networking was an important source of work. Co-working spaces are networking spaces and social spaces. So you have that isolation and you need to find that, that social gathering place. Um, like the person that introduced me, I didn't catch his name, I'm sorry, but the libraries for students, you know, you kind of, you can go there and you study and you can find groups to study with and learn together. And you kind of, you've done that your whole life and all the way through school and then you graduate and you go out into the real world and 
you kind of don't have that same connection anywhere. And so co-working spaces become those social spaces for people. 82% co-working has expanded their professional networks. 80% said they turn to co-working members for help, guidance, or to find work. And then co-working spaces are also learning spaces. 69% reported they learn new skills. 68% reported improving their existing skill set. And 67% reported that they attended co-working events at their space. So kind of like what you guys are doing with uh, Code RGV, it's exactly, you know, it's co-working. Co-working would be learning from each other, helping each other learn from your mistakes, and kind of getting that that uh, extra push and that extra drive to better yourself and to do, do a better job of whatever you're doing, or whatever you're freelancing. So how co-working is kind of connected to the valley. So I haven't said this yet, but I'm opening, I opened up a co-working space, or in the process of opening up a co-working space. It's called Grindstone Co-working. And how I landed on co-working is a long, windy road. And it's pretty ridiculous, to be honest with you. But um, I guess kind of every path is. So starting from the beginning, I, uh, I graduated <coughs> with an ocean engineering degree. I loved engineering. I wanted to do, you know, design things and kind of invent stuff. And that was like, you know, my childhood dream. So I graduated with an ocean engineering degree from uh, Texas a and I, at the last second, decided I want to move back to the Valley. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that they said earlier really resonated with me. I wanted to come back home. I wanted to be a leader in my community. I wanted to do stuff back here in the RGV. I didn't want to move to Houston and be a number. And so coming back over here, um, the only thing that kind of like related to ocean engineering was civil engineering. So that was like my default. I did that for three years. I worked for a private firm, um, took my fundamentals of engineering exam and all that stuff. And three years into it, I, could, I couldn't stand it. It was miserable. I was miserable. So um, looking for kind of an escape route, I just hopped over to teaching, kind of took it back to the basics of what I like. And I taught physics in the high school setting for six years. And so teaching was always kind of like a temporary thing. I didn't want to grow roots and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I always liked business and in the meantime I picked up photography. So picking up photography I started growing my photography business and I started meeting people at Starbucks and working in isolation in the summers by myself in my house and wanting to meet other people and bounce ideas off of them but I had no one. So I was on forums and you know leaving comments on YouTube videos and stuff like that. And uh, I talked to a friend in Dallas and I said hey where do you, he's a photographer, I said where do you shoot. He said, I shoot a shared studio. And I said, where do you work? He said, oh, I go to a co-working space. And so I said, cool, what's a co-working space? <laughs> and so three years ago, co-working is not as popular as it is now, and it's not even that popular now. So I had to figure out what a co-working space was. I fell in love with the idea, and I just dove right into co-working. I just devoted a lot of my free time to researching what co-working was, <coughs> where it came from, how it evolved. and. Within the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to go to three different co-working uh, co conferences. The first one I went to was in Kansas City. Um, and got to hear a lot of people you know, from industry leaders talking about co-working. People from all over the world came to Kansas City. And when you're in an industry that's about collaboration and about co-working and about teaching each other things, and then you go to a conference where everyone is about that, it was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, you know, just telling myself, please brain absorb everything, you know, trying to write things down as fast as I could. So, um, the second, this past May, there was another co-working conference in San Francisco. And so my big drive to go to this one, I wanted to give back because I felt like so many people had given me a lot of information. And so people that were behind the process and wanted to open a co-working space, I wanted to be in those group discussions and kind of, kind of give it back to them. The second thing was, this guy named Brad Newberg was talking. And so Brad Newberg was the founder of co-working. He developed the very first co-working space in San Francisco. And um, I wanted to see that and see that speech because co-working is kind of kind of becoming really popular and taking, you know, taking the world. And so I wanted to hear what he had to say, how he came up with the concept. And so he gets up on stage. I I'm sorry. He uh, before he gets up on stage, I'm running late to this, this whole talk. I rush over there, and I'm trying to get to a seat because I'm about to miss the talk that I want to go see. 
And before we get to get to sit down, this guy calls me over from Dallas and he's like, hey, these guys are from Texas, you know, these guys are from Texas, and he starts introducing us to all these people from Dallas and Austin and San Antonio. And um, a guy, you know, how many of you have ever tried to explain where the Rio Grande Valley is? <laughs> what, what does everyone say? I say South Texas, right? So, I, you know, some guy asking me, oh, where are you from? And I say, South Texas. And their first answer is, oh, San Antonio, right? And so I'm like, no, it's a lot more south than that. Four hours down, and that's where we're at. I was like, it's this place called the Rio Grande Valley. I didn't want to say Edinburgh specifically because that felt like a waste of time. And so I said, the Rio Grande Valley. This guy turns around and says, oh, you're from the Rio Grande Valley? I'm from McAllen. And we're like, oh, cool. And so we're about to start talking, and they kind of hush everyone, sit everyone down. And so I'm waiting for Brad Huber to go up and talk. And the guy who said, I'm from McAllen, is Brad Huber. So the person who developed co-working and came up with the term co-working and is like the founder of co-working is from McAllen. He, uh, in talking, we connected afterwards. He went to Ben Milam, Milam Elementary in McAllen. He graduated from Sci Tech. Um, and so his whole story that he got up and spoke about, which was really interesting, um, he kind of floated around between jobs. He had a he had a job where you know he had the corporate job working all the time, and then he had the freelance job where he was all by himself. And he's like, well, I like the coworkers and I like that aspect, but I like working for myself, and I kind of wanted the mixture of both of them. And he was a real big uh, he's, he's really into open source, and so he said he liked to you know develop code and kind of share it with people and let them pick off where he left off and make it better than he could. So his big his big speech was still this idea, remix it, make it your own. So he, he you know, wants everyone to kind of collaborate, grab something, make it better, continue the process with that. And so hearing him speak about this and then hearing that connection that he's from the Valley was, was really, really interesting. So um, he created a space. The very first co-working space was inside the Spiral Muse. It was this hippie yoga type of weird place in San Francisco. And he started these co-working meetups and he would invite people in. And uh, eventually, they opened another place called the Hat Factory. So the Hat Factory was the first official co-working space in the world. And um, pretty excited to be bringing this to the Valley. It feels kind of like a full circle thing. So, so, so what I'm doing, I've opened up Grandstone Co-working. I'm in the process of it, and it's been a big headache for the <laughs> most part. Um, we've had all kinds of construction issues and things like that, but you know, you just kind of got to push through those things. Um, and so Grindstone Co-working is actually located right across the university. Does anyone know where La Pesca is at? Um, La Pesca restaurant, right next to La Pesca. We have 4,000 square feet. And the big concept of co-working is the community aspect of it. We're not an executive business center. We're not a virtual office. I mean, we all, we, we're not a business center, you know, per se. We have some of those amenities, and you know, we, we want to help people with those types of things. But our main focus is the community aspect of everything. We want to pull people out of their home offices, get them away from the Starbucks, and where you know maybe like a tech incubator is going to be focused on people who code. You know, so far we have 13 full members and two offices out of four full, and we have uh, a magazine company called RG Vision. They have a team of graphic designers and photographers and stuff like that. We have CPAs, we have attorneys, we have a right away acquisition agent. I mean, we have a spectrum of people who are. We're working at home and saw an ad on Facebook and gave me a call and loved the concept. And so right now we're really trying to grow our community and trying to like build that foundation that we really believe is going to be something special here in the Valley. Um, I have a commercial, but we have no sound. so it's No, kinda... try it, actually. Might work. Meet Karen, a small business owner who worked in her home and the local coffee shop. Her house is comfortable but isolating and not a place to meet clients. Add to that the distractions of family life, kids, pets, and chores waiting to get done. She works late at night to catch up. The coffee shop has free Wi-Fi and great coffee, but it's not built for business. From the noisy espresso machine to the chatty couple at the next table over, the lack of privacy proves challenging to get work done or to meet clients without being awkward. She tried getting an office in a business center, but didn't see value in spending money on an office where she would still be alone most of the time. Karen looked online to find what others are doing. That's when she learned about co-working and found the Grindstone, the first co-working space in the Rio Grande Valley. Grindstone Co-working is a membership-based office built for people like Karen. 
a space designed for privacy when you need it and collaboration when you want it. The Grindstone provides private offices, meeting rooms, phone booths, a place to lounge, and a cafe area in a tech-friendly, inspiring environment. The affordable membership options at the Grindstone include community events, Wi-Fi, and endless coffee. Karen's business is thriving, and she's never been happier. <laughs> so, uh, so at Grindstone, I guess one one big thing that people kind of have a hard time understanding is they walk into a space because everyone's used to executive business centers and things like that, and they want to draw lines around what's mine, like what's my area, and so we're kind of the opposite of that. It's a shared space, it's a collaborative space, and so you pay a membership, and the best way to explain it is like a gym. You pay a membership at a gym, you go work out. If the bench is taken, you wait until the bench is not taken. If uh, you know the pull up bar is taken, you kind of wait until that's not taken. And so we have a software system to reserve conference rooms, but other than that, it's pretty much open seating. You can sit wherever you'd like. We're going to have community led uh, classes, so our CPA can teach a class about how to save money on your taxes in 2015. And he can get in front of all of our members. Our members are going to get a lot of value out of that. And then a graphic designer can talk about how to make sure your social media pages look professional. And so back to the a learning space, we really want it to be a community-driven uh, place where people can be productive, have a professional work environment, and learn and grow their business. So, so my Twitter handle is on the bottom, at Coworking Dan. Um, if you want to follow, if you have any questions, and reach out. Brands on Coworking, we're on social media platforms. And I have cards up here if anyone wants any more information. Um, and that's it. Any questions? So, first of all, congratulations for your project. And when did you uh, start it? When was the inauguration day? For the, the like opening day? Yeah. So we're not officially open yet okay. because we've had construction issues and installation. So we're kind of in limbo right now. So we kind of halted all the you know furniture and stuff like that. But we. We do have furniture in there, we have Wi-Fi, we have coffee, and so what we're doing right now is we're signing members up, and we're inviting them into the space, come and <coughs> use it, just excuse the mess, and then our official day will start, like our membership day. It will be like in the next month? We're thinking, yeah, within the month or so. I have <laughs> construction meeting, I've been saying that forever. <laughs> we have a construction meeting tomorrow, and basically what happened was they didn't put any insulation, because they didn't have an engineer review plans. And so we need a spray insulation, which means plastic over everything, spray insulation, spray painting everything black. So, and just a little bit about the space. It's 4,000 square feet. We have four private offices. We have a cafe. Those renders up there are pretty similar to what it looks like. Um, we have a cafe area. We have a partnership with Moonbeams Coffee, so we're going to have uh, Moonbeams deliver coffee weekly to us. Um, we have a big room that's like a multi-co-working room slash classroom and also have people use it as a photography studio. And we have two <coughs> rooms, we have two phone booths. So in a Starbucks, if you need to take a phone call, you see people walk outside and pace up and down the street or sidewalk. And here we have two phone booths. Uh, you can plug in, write stuff on a whiteboard, and stuff like that. And um, the prices vary or? So the prices vary based on how many days you need or what amenities you want. So you need extra conference room time and things like that. You can pay per hour, or you can buy a bucket of hours or you can buy a membership that has hours included. And so they start at $50 and right now our big promotion is $150 per month. And you get basically five days a week, business hours. We're gonna try to make it as high tech as possible, like proxy cards, online booking systems, things like that to make it very seamless. So we want people to take ownership of the space and come in and feel like that's their home. And you, you have a question? Yeah, my question was, uh, what do you, so you've got like uh, 12, 13, 14 people signed up now? Yeah, 13, 13 full members. 13 then, full members? And then we have two offices. So I was wondering what's the uh, capacity? Uh, if you get the 50 members or 100 members, how many So, would you so say? going to the co working conferences, everyone's rule of thumb is about three times as many seats as you have. And so we have probably close to 85 seats. So this it, it kind of depends on, on what industries are like involved within this space. But um, I mean, a lot of people, even some of the members now, they sign up and they come every day. 
other members sign up and they come take a meeting twice a week. But they, they love being there. They love coming and having a cup of coffee and talking to other people. And they'll take their meeting, hang out for a little while, and take off again. And so I, I think it's kind of, we'll probably feel it out and see how everything goes. Yes, sir. Um, uh, what are the hours allotted for um, someone being there? Like, is it open like Monday through Fridays, open weekends? Kind of so thing? initially what we're going to do is going to do just kind of like business hours from 8 to 6 or 7.30 to 6 or something like that. And then I think we're looking at implementing because we've got a lot of questions about uh, a lot of people have a full-time job and then they do like a, another side business at night. And so we'll probably have like a nights and weekends type of pass and then integrate that into an add-on for regular memberships. And so we want to make it pretty easy. You know, you have a card, you come in, you scan in, and you go sit down and work and get connected. Um, we don't have a receptionist. So there's no, uh, you know, no one's answering the phone for you. No one's taking messages and things like that. We want people just to come in and use the space. Yes, ma'am. You said you were partnering with Moonbeams. Are you located there? Where are you located? We're located almost on 107 and 7th, University and 7th Street, like right at Caddy Corner to the old bookstore, I think it was. 107 and what? 7th Street. Okay. You want to pull so, up the Google map? Yeah. Are you guys in Google already? Mm -hmm. Read this. <laughs> it's not even here in the valley. Reading my so this is this is an old farmer's building. And so we completely remodeled that and took the ceilings up. So there's La Pesca. Oh, right across Quick Walk, I guess. I don't know what <coughs> and that drive through. Try the map, yeah. Yeah. office we have only has two desks and two chairs but for them they were able to add on memberships to their office plan and so four people float around and two people have like a stationary desk one other person is like a salesperson the other one's um, you know a graphic designer that kind of goes to different businesses and things like that so we have a small office that's available it's one desk a filing cabinet shelves oh they're fully furnished also and then the other office is two desks, filing cabinet, and, and a shelving system. And how much do those uh, rent for? Uh, we're pre-leasing them, the small one for 600 and the larger one for 700 Yes, sir. Uh, so, like, from the initial campaign, like, how much is the deal being made? Like, how hard and how long did it take to get the investment money to do it? And then how long do you think it will take to, like, become possible? Um, so from, I guess when I discovered the initial concept, I want to say it was probably close to four years ago. Everything's kind of based off of like, my son's four and a half years old, and so I started photography right before he was born and stuff. So he's four and a half years old, so I want to say <coughs> years ago I discovered the concept, um, was doing all my research and stuff like that. One of the things that I did that kind of like helped me jump into, self, in, into this was uh, because I taught for six years, I was able to pay off close to $20,000 of my student debt. Um, and I was just saving up money, paying off debt, paying off debt, paying off debt. And um, I want to say probably two years when we decided that we were going to pull the trigger as, a, like, as my family. And um, from then on, it was kind of saving and getting ready to ramp up to where we're at right now. And to be profitable, um, I, I'm not sure to be honest with you. I, I'm really hoping that after year one we will be. But I, you know, talking to other people at conferences and stuff like that, it kind of it kind of depends on in which market you're at, 
And I know because we're the first in this market, it's going to be an uphill battle, I guess, to kind of get to where we need to be. But you know, we're determined to, to make it successful. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But so you financed it yourself? Yes. One last question. Why did you um, put the name Grindstone? Why that name? Um, so co-working is a concept, and I really wanted to have the word co-working in it to you know intrigue people and see you know what's co-working, and they looked it up and kind of figure out what we're doing. Um, so Grindstone, there's there's a couple of different quotes. You know, keep your nose to the grindstone, which is a, I don't know if you know what a grindstone is. Like a grindstone was a, an old-fashioned wheel, a stone, and they would sharpen tools on it. So if you had an axe, they'd have this spinning wheel, and you kind of sharpen your blades. So it's kind of like a, a place to sharpen your tools to, to get sharper and grow. Or another another saying is keep your nose to the grindstone, which is kind of keep on working hard, keep on hustling, keep on grinding it out. And so kind of like both of those aspects I really liked about it. So that's so that one went. After 100, 100 other you know names that I'm like, no, that's not going to work. That's not <laughs>